This is the December 19th um, um, gonna, I'm going to have uh, Chris read the hybrid meeting or Jennifer and Karina or somebody. Uh, either or. All right. Thank you. Okay. The meeting of the Essex Junction Development Review Board now uh we'll now come to order this meeting is a hybrid meeting held both at two lincoln street and on zoom because there are many tef technical difficulties or reasons that other otherwise prevent or interrupt remote public participation it is important to note that the open meeting law only ensures that the public's right to participate and comment at a public meeting by attending at the designated physical location as posted in the notice and agenda. If a member of the public uh, or, a, or of the public body has technical difficulties accessing this meeting remotely, please alert us by using the chat feature on Zoom or by emailing cun at essexjunction.org. And in the event of a technical difficulty that cannot be resolved, we may continue the meeting if necessary uh, to January 18th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. at 2 Lincoln Street, Essex Junction. Uh, please note that all votes taken during this meeting uh, that are not unanimous will be done by roll call vote in accordance with the law. Uh, whew, sorry. As required by the open meeting law, let's start the meeting by taking roll, roll call attendance of all members participating in the meeting uh, and those members attending remotely identify themselves uh, to ensure that they can hear and be heard throughout the meeting, uh, if necessary, I guess. Yes, it is necessary because oh, yeah. Roberts is uh, oh, okay. Good. online. All right. So Roberts online. Anyone else online? Do we have a four or five? Nine? It appears that we have four. Is, um, is, Dylan, is Dylan around? I don't. There is no Dylan on Zoom. All right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Works better that way. Um, Robert, let's just make sure your sound is working. Uh, can you just indicate that you're here? Rob is here. Excellent. Nice. Um, okay, so um, can, are there any additions or amendments to the agenda tonight, Chris or Jennifer? I don't think we have any changes. No. Okay. No. Um, item two, public to be heard. This is for members of the audience uh, or online that uh, want to speak to an item that is not on the agenda tonight. Is there anybody willing, wishing to speak tonight? Hearing none, we'll move on to... Um, uh, minutes. So we had two sets of minutes. Um, I had no objections to any of the minutes, and I had a motion to approve the last two sets of minutes. And uh, just so everybody knows, there was no actual business conducted at the last two meetings because the um, item that was supposed to be heard was a table. So, uh, does anybody have any comments? Oh, I need a motion. First. Motion to motion approve. to approve the October and November meeting minutes. Thank you, Maggie. Second. A second. Awesome. Uh, any discussion? Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes as issued? Aye. 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 Um, all right. Since there's only four, they carry unanimously. Thank you. Uh, public hearing <laughs> number one: uh, administrative appeal. Uh, appeal of Administrative Officer's Notice of Violation at 8 Taft Street in the R1 District by Jason Struthers' owner. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the format for this is, but um, I guess what I should really do is swear in anybody who wants to speak tonight about any of the topics. So um, anybody who's who wants to speak, um, raise your right hand and... Um, uh, answer I do after I read this. I hereby swear that the evidence I give in the cause under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Thank you. Thank you. And online, how does that work, Chris? Do they just 
they're they're sworn in. <clears throat> they they have they have this participated. They just did so. All right, good. Uh, moving on. So uh, we have an appeal. There's a staff report. Um, uh, does does somebody make a presentation like a regular application? You want to walk people through this, Chris, or uh, does the uh, appellant make a statement, or how does this go? So I mean, I, I can give a little bit of introduction as to uh, what this appeal is about. Um, so at the uh, September 21st uh, Development Review Board hearing uh, on the Administrative Officer Zoning Enforcement decision uh, at 8 Taft Street, uh, the DRB concluded that the city may enforce its land development code against Mr. Struthers uh, with regards to his farming activities, specifically raising ducks. So this decision is, uh, is memorialized in the findings of fact and decision uh, that was signed by the Development Re Review Board members on October 6th. So uh, staff had noticed that, uh, that uh, the resident at 8 Taft Street, Jason Struthers, has continued to raise ducks on the property since the decision, um, despite receiving a letter uh, from the Assistant Zoning Administrator re requesting compliance, uh, which was dated November 6, 2023. So on November 20th, the Administrative Officer, who is me, uh, Christopher Ewan, um, issued Mr. Struthers uh, an official uh, notice of violation pursuant to 24 VSA 4451. This notice of violation enables the city to initiate enforcement efforts against Mr. Struthers with fines of up to $200 per day if the violation continues. I will note that um, the timing uh, and, and decisions regarding uh, the, the city's pursuit of, uh, of uh, uh, actual enforcement and fines is, uh, is something that is decided by the, uh, by the city council uh, in conjunction with uh, the city manager. So uh, you know, over here where, uh, the, the job of the uh, Development Review Board is just to interpret uh, the law. So, yeah, that's where we are today. Uh, this, is, this is an appeal of the uh, notice of violation uh, filed uh, by Mr. Struthers' attorney. Is there anything else, uh, any other background you need? Um, <clears throat> no, I, I had four or five uh, comments and questions myself, but uh, should I just go ahead with those? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, one, the violation of appears to be uh, still in, you know, we're still in violation. We were in violation before the state showed up to say, you know, we think you might have a, a farm. We were in violation after that. We're um, We've issued our our findings uh, at our last meeting, and that's been appealed. So I'm I'm wondering how the appeal process mentioned in the um, in this where it's going already. Something is is pending before the Superior Court Environmental Division, and and the notice here indicates that that kind of supersedes whatever we're doing. So I'm just wondering how that really plays out. So that's correct. Uh, there is uh, there are appeals from uh, both parties uh, right now. Uh, Mr. Struthers has uh, appealed uh, the, the city's uh, decision to the environmental courts, and Mr. Patnos has uh, uh, done that as well uh, for um, on the opposing side. Uh, we've got. Um, I think the uh, Mr. Struthers has, uh, has has attorneys on online right now. If uh, you'd like to hear from any of them, uh, they are available. Well, I, I guess my point is, if it's true that whatever the outcome is is dependent on the courts, because I've you know we have a part to play in this, but we're only a stepping stone. Um, I would be tempted to allow the courts to make their ruling before we change our minds, but. My, I don't see any new evidence in in the case for us. I feel like our role is to continue to say we told you what we thought the first time and we still feel that way. So um, 
that's that's how I find this the the only um, I guess uh, moderating thought I have is I, I think they bring up a good point about the ducks, which is you the the disposition of the ducks if we say you know if they actually comply with the um, with the violation notice and and do something with the ducks seems kind of final and it'd be hard to come back from that so I'm a little um, you know sensitive to to that being a interesting plight for the ducks uh, that if we just wait till the environmental court makes their ruling then we either have you know it's okay or it's not okay so I'm a little swayed by that but on the other hand I don't find any reason to change my mind about our particular position at this point so uh, what does the rest of the board feel? I I feel like we should uphold our decision. Right. So that's, that's the part we play, yeah. and then whatever yeah. happens to the ducks, I, yeah, that's I'm the, not sure I want all the ducks to disappear, except if they're going somewhere where they're okay. You know, like they could yeah, go on I to a... Like and, and the other, there was a factual, uh, I think, um, misstatement in the document submitted, which says that there was no... Uh, or that the uh, agriculture was uh, um, uh, prohibited in in all the zoning districts, and that's not actually true. It's allowed in the agricultural districts. So you know the fact that whole farming operation could exist somewhere else legally inside the city, just not in R one. So um, I I just don't know how to make that correction. You know it's not my testimony that this is the notice, but uh, that's my testimony that that's how our our uh, zoning ordinance says. So um, anyway, so I, I'm in favor of, of uh, upholding our position. All things, uh, I don't, still don't know what to do with the rest of it. All right? So do we, I don't know that we need, that. there's no, I don't know what testimony happens. I, I just, I don't know who else we need to hear from. I'm not inclined to, you know, waste a lot of time on everybody's behalf if the if the city's going to uphold its previous decision, which I see no reason to overturn. I mean, uh, I I think I think this can be treated like other development review board items where they where members of the public who uh, would like to make uh, public comments uh, generally gets uh, gets the time to do so. And what's our limit on? Speaking, everybody gets at least two or three minutes, but so we can all get through this without being here all night. I, that's that's up to no you filibusters. Too. Can't repeat yourself, that kind of thing. All right, so those are the rules. Uh, I will uh, open it to the members of the public that are here on the floor tonight, and then we'll go to the screen. Yes, sir. say your name uh, for I the record and come up to the. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you sit the chair? Right here. Yeah. Microphone. Yeah. Mr. Murphy, what can I do for you? I, uh, I I'm I'm here representing the um, landowner, Mr. Struthers, and um, uh, I I I think I agree with you that there's not much to be said tonight. Um, we continue to disagree with the. Uh, city on its interpretation of its ordinance. It is currently before the environmental court and the environmental court will make a decision on whether uh, the city has that authority or not. And in the interim, I'm not sure if your council has shared with you the fact that there's actually a, uh, that the that the city has entered into a, a stipulation that um, they would not file an enforcement complaint until the court made a decision or until March 15th, uh, if the court hasn't made a decision by that point. So I think tonight, um, the only reason for this uh, hearing is uh, or if you if, if, the, if the board wants to uphold the uh, notice of violation, then we will appeal it to the environmental court and it'll be heard at the same time as the current um, appeal. But but I don't think we need to uh, waste any time on, on testimony. It's still a legal issue. 
the legal issue is, does the town have the t authority to uh, regulate farming or, or not? And we're waiting, all waiting for the environmental court to make that determination. And as we said, we think that uh, legally, while it's pending before the environmental court, that um, the city doesn't actually have jurisdiction, but we're, we're certainly willing to let you go ahead, uphold your uh, notice of violation, and then we'll appeal it and it'll all be back in the environmental court. Very good. Thank you. That clarifies a lot. All right. Uh, we still, we're going to listen to a little testimony and then uh, <laughs> hopefully move on. Yeah, I'd like to uh, first inform the group and show on that I am a farmer. I own a 110-acre uh, property in Westford in addition to uh, my ownership of a property on uh, Half Street. And I have a, a bit of experience with the Department of Agriculture. And I also have some experience with the environmental court. So I'll share with you what, what I think you need to do. Uh, I'm not convinced that the uh, property itself has ever been determined by the Department of Agriculture to be an agricultural property. There are two rules. Are the things that he's doing qualify as agricultural activities? But before you uh, can uh, perform agricultural activities, you have to have a property that's designated as an agricultural property. In order to have that done, uh, that determination is supposed to be made before um, uh, the uh, farming operation actually begins. And the process itself involves the uh, uh, town uh, zoning uh, people, and it involves input from the uh, people who are on, uh, in the proximity of, of the area. The agricultural regulations themselves are relatively complex, and I'm not going to speak to all of them. But I would ask that this uh, group that work with the Department of Agriculture, take your questions into them, and get their input, which will be very valuable uh, in taking this case forward if you have to go to the court. I have found in the past the Department of Agriculture does not flow out with information very readily, but I would make an effort to uh, pin them down. The uh, farm determinations uh, that uh, he uh, has alluded to, I'm not sure that he has earned $2,000. If he has not, that's perjury because he had to certify that. In order to uh, qualify as an agricultural operation, he has to, uh, 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 on his tax forms, include a uh, 1,040 uh, F income tax uh, form, uh, which is a, is a very, uh, it's a separate thing from everything else, but in order to qualify as a farm, he's got to pay taxes as a farmer would and, uh, and so on. I think before this goes before the environmental uh, court, that all of the answers here uh, uh, be checked. Did he earn two thousand dollars? If if you're in an agricultural business, you have to have receipts, and your taxes have to reflect uh, what you uh, what you uh, earned. Uh, uh, there are many more. Uh, uh, qualifying issues as to whether or not a farm property is a farm property, and uh, what you have in front of you doesn't uh, doesn't cut it. There's much more. Uh, for instance, he has to go to school uh, uh, to study uh, uh, matters related to uh, wastewater. Uh, it, it that's uh, qualified. Uh, as a small farm, he has to recertify on an annual basis. I don't know that anything like that has happened. The person who owns the property, we talk, uh, property we're talking about, I consider a friend. Uh, I uh, find it very difficult to uh, come to you with, with this kind of testimony. But uh, 
I don't, I don't want to wind up living on a property uh, that has uh, pigs uh, next to me. And I wouldn't want to live on a property that has the smell of manure from the ducks and the noise of the ducks. It significantly uh, diminishes the uh, value of the property. And I do not believe that the uh, town, uh, I'm trying to think of the term, administrator who's responsible, was in any way ever consulted before the agricultural operations uh, began to take place. There are all kinds of things like off offsets that have to be considered, not only for the structures, the structures have to be determined ag as agricultural. Um, well, I guess I just about got, <laughs> got to the end. Um, Thank you. We're, we're not sure about any of that either, so I'm, I'm yeah. waiting to see what happens in court. Right. But I, I the, uh, Even the, there are considerations with regard to where uh, manure and so on can be stored, and there are specific offsets for that. I don't know if the town has any information on that. Maybe you do. I'm coming into this late. I apologize. Uh, right. And if I've covered something that you've already covered, forgive me, please. We, we're, we have a much simpler thought process, which is it's not allowed in our zoning district for that zoning district, so it shouldn't be there. Right. Whatever the state came and did, it happened after it was illegal. Right. So it doesn't, you're it doesn't have any reason to be there. We think it should be gone. You're absolutely correct. In order, to the gun. in order for that property to be determined an agricultural property, it first has to... Uh, you first have to look at the uh, op the, the uh, things that are conducted on it, but then uh, there has to be a, a form uh, submitted uh, for the determination of an agricultural property, and the town has to be involved, and the people living next door have to be involved. I think he's in a situation where a uh, order of cease and desist, which I think you've already done, uh, is an order. Awesome. Thank Did you. Did we get your name? Uh, Ron Fry. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the... Mr. Chair, can we ask the witness to just identify where he lives and how it relates to uh, the location of Mr. Struthers' property, just for the record? I, uh, I live on 16 Taft Street, about uh, three properties down from uh, the uh, property involved. And, Thank you. Uh, uh, down the road, there may be other requests that will involve uh, whether or not agricultural activities can take place. And down the road, I'm afraid that uh, my property could be pulled into uh, uh, the situation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, anyone else in the audience here? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, Stephen Willie, Bad Nose at 6 Taft Street next door. Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with everything you said. Um, I think uh, there's a little bit, um, so a couple of things, details here. Um, the issue before the environmental court where both Mr. Struthers and we have appealed, you know, because it was a split decision, <laughs> uh, um, that's actually for the, um, that's actually for the DRB decision, not for the notice of violation. So it's a silly hair to split, but the notice is not before the environmental court. The decision that enforcement should happen for agriculture and shouldn't for cannabis, those are before the environmental court. Yeah, sorry, I'm an engineer. We split hairs too. So, yeah. So, the actually the stipulation that Mr. Murphy um, referred to, uh, I believe it hasn't been accepted by the court yet. Uh, it's proposed. Um, it was a proposal uh, that was. Uh, drawn up between the city and Mr. Struthers uh, attorneys, although mine, I'm not sure that our input was considered. We had actually proposed a similar um, stipulation. 
Um, so the, the thing about that is that the environmental court, they may issue an order. They, they may agree to that stipulation, at which point the city, through Chris and Regina, the manager, would choose to schedule enforcement as they schedule it, as you said, Chris. Um, but this, I think, as pretty much everyone has said, your uh, your decision is still, I think, the same because the facts haven't changed. Uh, the one fact that has changed is that now, apparently, there are about fifty ducks instead of being about you know fifteen or so a year ago and maybe thirty a few months ago. That that number doesn't come from me counting. That comes from another filing with the superior court. Um, so, you know this. Instead of slowing down and realizing that there's a conflict, there's litigation, or that there's a there is something happening, and kind of slowing down to see where things go, Mr. Struthers has decided to increase his operation from you know one dozen to four dozen ducks, from about twenty cannabis plants to about a hundred, and now the ducks which he raises for meat and eggs again according to a stipulation or excuse me according to a statement to the court uh you know these are farm animals they're not pets and i i agree that it would cause harm uh and so i'm not you know i i feel for the uh for the ducks and for the impact that that destroying them would have um so i can i can accept you know a a delay um but as has been pointed out this has been going on for four years and mr struthers first asked for a variance recognizing you know which implies that he recognized that he was in violation in march of 2022 so it's been nearly two years um, and at that time he said he needed about two years to move he just wanted a temporary extension basically or a temporary permission so that he could move to a place where farming is allowed so it sound, seems like it's about time for that to happen. And it sounds like something's happening by March or in March, uh, which I'm sure isn't soon enough for some people. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the, it feels like my hands are somewhat tied. So I'm going to let the courts play out. I'd like to make our determination and findings and move on because I don't think we can do anything. So the court, until somebody tells me I can, and I'm just, going to continue to say that it's not supposed to be here it's not allowed in this zoning district it is allowed in another zoning district let's move on all right uh so anyone want to make a motion i'll do it i'll make the motion okay girl um i motion that the dr the development review board uphold the administrators administrative officers notice of violation from for the unlawful condition of property on 8 Taft Street, issued on November 20th, 2023. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously, thank you. And we appreciate the testimony from everyone on this matter. It's complicated. It's a, it's a pretty interesting situation um there are lots of lawyers and people that are uh need to sort out before the rest of us get to continue on again so let them do their thing we'll keep moving on um item two thank you and have a good holiday thank you very much thank you thank you uh item two tonight public hearings final plan for a two lot subdivision lot one to retain existing single family dwelling lot two to be single lot at two river street in the r2 district uh is the applicant here and would you like to come up and um present how are you brian good how are you john good on mic <laughs> Provide your name, and you already testified that you'll 
uh, under oath and all that. So go ahead, but why don't you just state your name and so forth. Okay. Uh, Brian Currier, O'Leary Burke Civil Associates. Uh, your name, Lou? Uh, so we're back um, after a couple uh, continuance requests. Uh, thank you very much to the city staff and the board for granting those requests. We had some health issues in the office that uh, were uh, hampering getting the plans uh, turned back around after the engineer's comments. Um, so the proposal in front of you uh, tonight is very similar to the to the sketch plan approval. Um, it's essentially a three tenths of an acre. Uh, existing developed lot in the R2 district. Um, we're proposing a simple two lot subdivision, both lots, uh, lot one of 7,500 square feet, minimum lot size in the district is 75, um, and lot two, uh, just over 8,700 8, square feet. Um, without a proposal in front of you uh, tonight, a single family or a duplex could be pulled with the simple zoning permit. Anything more than that would need to come back to you for a site plan review. Um, so we have provided a, a plot and a, a site plan. Um, we've answered the engineer's comments. Um, would you like me to jump into the staff report, John, or would you like, um, to, uh, I, I didn't see a whole lot in the staff report that requires comment. I think, um, you know, we got the, the basics. Yeah. Uh, I, do you, um, are there any items that you want to highlight that you don't agree with or you, or you, that you won't be complying with, or are you pretty good with that? No, uh, I think the only comment in there that we've already complied with is the minimum lot size. When we were working out the ratios, we were a few square feet shy on lot one, so that's been adjusted. It's reflected in the sheet or the, uh, the plat that's on the screen right now. Okay. I think the only other item to discuss is the uh, three options for the sidewalk that's in the... Uh, in the staff report okay where where is the driveway for the second lot? I don't, am I... yeah so the site plan shows uh an approximate curb cut location so it's furthest from the intersection on the right side of lot two so we have a uh... area right over there yeah that's it yep. oh okay okay lightly had it oh so it wasn't okay Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. So did everybody understand three options? I guess. So here's my, my, the crux of it for me is the sub, uh, division regulations appear to require sidewalk and in other places like Williston, um, you know, we've watched them build their sidewalk system in a patchwork fashion where Whoever comes in to develop something, the sidewalk in, we don't care where it's got to go. And it looks kind of funny for a while, but eventually it'll all be sewn together and it'll look fine, right? So in theory, that's kind of the baseline for me that it's supposed to be there. And uh, and yet we got a situation here where it there's some other things that appear to make sense. But the one question I have is, if it, which we didn't know last time, we didn't know that the the city had a uh, a master plan that included which side of the street the sidewalk was supposed to be on. So we kept wondering, you know, well, does it go? On? What if it goes on the other side of the street? Well, maybe there's something to that. So since we're only doing a sidewalk on one side of the street, and it's now been determined that it it is proposed by the the city to occur on the north side, then uh, now the whole sidewalk's in play again. The question in the options is where does it go? Did they build the portion that's in front of the two lots being subdivided? Did they build a different portion of the equivalent length or they, do they provide uh, a, a payment to the city so that when the city ultimately does the sidewalk, they've contributed, right? So if if they weren't doing it like the only question i had was if they aren't doing it if the applicants weren't here would the city pave it anyway and how come nobody you know like that that would just be in the capital plan and it would happen right so now you'll have an applicant who's doing a project we're saying put the sidewalk in because that's what the regs say but we've now given them some options so 
Explain that part to me. Like, why are there options? So, I mean, th these are these are not these are options for the DRB to consider. These are not really uh, really options for uh, well uh, for the applicants. All right. Uh, so hold on a second, because uh, well, our, I, we did get a letter from Diane Clements, who's on the Planning Commission, and I think her take on this is extremely germane, which is we're all aiming for more connectivity. We all want more walkability. This is a thoroughfare down to one of our major employers. It should be there. I, I tend to agree with that, and I don't know why I have options. Like, why is the city willing to, to cede the the creation of the sidewalk i i don't i don't think the city is willing is really willing to see the creation of the sidewalk but what i was hearing during the last uh the, the conceptual uh subdivision plan hearing was that uh uh you know the, the drb had some had some reservations uh about uh you know, about requiring this the sidewalk but i know that new information has come in and that's why the you know option one is kind of the, diff that's, the reason why is at the top and it's considered option one is because it is it, it is what uh, yeah. a straight read of the land development code would yield. All right. Um, anyway, that's my only question. So the, does anyone else on the board have a question about the option? I mean, I think the op option one is the preferred and we need to have the sidewalk there. Oh, I was... Well, uh, I, I... for me, that I don't know that option one is the default. I think option one is already a twist because yeah. Yeah. my read of the straight requirement is they would build the section in front of their land and not have to get into whatever's curbed or whatever's happening up on the end. So it's a different, you know, like they build the one in front of them and when anybody or the city wants to finish it off they do mm -hmm. that to me is that that's what we're supposed to be doing and then that would be option three well actually that would be that's option zero that, that would be option zero, zero. Right? Yeah. okay i suppose I, I was trying to simplify this based on what what um i heard during the last yeah. hearing yeah. But, and it was confusing because we really didn't understand whether there was any uh previously conceived plan in this area so we found out two things one, yes, there is. Two, it's on that side of the street. So now um, option zero is you build it, right? Any other option is is a twist on that. And I remember from last time the lot one, is there space to build the, the sidewalk in front of that? Because that's right up again. It's very close. It's close. So it's... And that's obnoxious, but that's, okay. that's <laughs> the deal. It's... Can I... Yeah. So, so yeah. I think... My read of the staff report is that the sidewalk's in the capital improvement plan, but to say that there's a definitive plan of what side of the street it goes on is based on a planning commission discussion from 20 years ago about Riverside of the Village carrying a sidewalk down to River Street, and that just happens to be on the north side of the road. You know, there's a wetland crossing over there that's under consideration. Getting a permit to cross a wetland for a redundant sidewalk connection that... Let's be honest, everyone coming down River Street is going to take a right and go to Park Road. That's not really minimizing impact. Might be a difficult conversation to have with the wetlands folks. IBM's over half a mile away. You got to go through a booth. I don't know if they're inviting pedestrian traffic uh, anytime soon. Or Sorry, Global Foundries. Um, so I, I think there's a little more gray area there than uh than uh straight up there's a scoping study that shows this is what we want this is how much money it's going to cost and this is our time frame to do it we've already proposed the easement um we think that is in line with the scope and scale of our development there's two lots being proposed 160 feet of sidewalk is a substantial impact to a two lot subdivision this is a large multifamily building you know easier to stomach but for a two lot subdivision and, uh, you know, we just feel it's it's uh, overkill given the scope. And I think we're doing our part by keeping essentially all options open to the village in the future. 
uh, it's all fair. That's also all fair. Um, I would uh, ask for more information from my board members. My thought is that the Land Development Code was kind of written with the idea we are going to be more bike walk friendly, and that's what we'd like to do. And so with this subdividing section, the idea that if you're subdividing, you're going to like create this space and we can waive it if there's an alternative which provides equal or superior pedestrian access. And I just don't see that. Yeah, and I think what we spoke about last time was if the sidewalk took a different route, then it is superior to essentially giving nothing. So, you know, uh, just to go through the options with, with option one, we wouldn't be interested in, as you spoke, there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's vegetation, there's a traffic, uh, uh, pole in the way surveying the abutting property would be an issue. So option one is considerably, uh, more expensive than just doing it in front of our lots. And then option two, um, the, the pay, uh, in lieu fee, uh, you know, Seems like there might be some complications there, um, but uh, in my opinion, the the budget for the in lieu fee is substantially more than what the sidewalk would cost, and uh, by just building it, so we wouldn't be interested in option two either. Um, so, as uh, you know, we've stated, I think option three is a is a fair middle ground. Um, you know, in my opinion, the subdivision standards are there for, you know building new roads um i think we're you know if we were building a new road here there'd be no question there'd be a sidewalk on it no doubt about it. um any other rob do you have any any comment uh no not really i i drive down this road every day so i know how tight it's going to be to get a sidewalk in there um but it, um yeah you, know, you know you got a big apartment complex down there on franklin i could see it definitely being useful for folks to have a sidewalk but we're not talking about sidewalk all the way to franklin we're talking about just what's in front of the property yeah and the, the 400 units in riverside we understand is a, is a large user but the southernmost units if you've ever been up that back entrance that kind of snakes up through there is there's a retaining wall all their entrances go to the front to think yep. anyone there is going to turn around go down that entrance go down river street and then take a ride to the five corners I'd be walking to work. I don't think so. And that's a tough conversation to have with the wetlands program, too. So uh, can I ask of the city staff um, what the real, uh, I mean, is, what, what is the real status of, of this connection piece envisioned for this street? Is it? Does it exist on paper somewhere as a line? If if the city really was going to engineer something and build it, would it would it really go on the north side? So this is in the capital plan um, in two parts: uh, the section between Park Streets and Stanton Drive is one piece, and the uh, from Stanton to uh to franklin is uh another piece um it's it's on the capital plan it is not it, it it is not certain when that will be uh you know when it will actually uh you know make it to the top of the list uh, but all the assumptions have been that it is on the north side uh you know for and and that is really based on connectivity to uh the, the population center over here this is um Riverside by the village is the the densest part of the city in terms of uh, population uh, you know, per square mile, and um, yeah, in in terms of connectivity, I I just see the north side as as the most plausible um, uh, you know, location where where we will have the future sidewalk. Also, if it's on the south side, you would you would have to cross the street again right here. But it doesn't. It hasn't been engineered. It's like not. It not is not engineered. developed no, to the right. point where somebody you know has a plan that shows shows it around. That, that, that's correct. Um, yeah, that's. Um, 
All right. Uh, I'm going to go to the audience for uh, comment from the audience. Is there anyone? Steve? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we do that? I, I, I think it would make sense for you to speak. Yeah, for presenter spot. Thank you. So thank you for allowing me to speak. So um, I've commuted on this road for 28 years. I was on the board of trustees when we first looked at this, engineered it. I was involved in the planning commission decisions, Riverside and the village. It's always been the north side of the road. Um, the part in front of these properties is absolutely the most dangerous portion on that road. People walk daily to Global Foundries. I've almost hit people because there's nowhere for them to go. The lighting isn't great and it's scary when you're driving home and it's a 35 mile an hour road i don't think we necessarily need like a five or six foot grass buffer to the sidewalk and all of that we just need a sidewalk i know there's you know not a lot of space but as you're approaching the cars people uh, racing to get through the light before it turns red it's just a really dangerous area um again i've, I've walked it run it biked it you know every everything as and when we talk about walkability in the city plan it's not always just to like get somewhere people want to go for a walk they're going to take a loop or something you know it's not always like i have to go only from point a to point b creating this connector here creates a a, a big connection through riverside and um it's something you know and right now we haven't had a lot of money for the capital plan in recent years that's why we got the lot passed there's a dedicated thing for sidewalks so you know the hope uh, is that over time you know my hope is that now we can start funding some of these sidewalk projects and stuff that haven't been able to make it because you know we've got the culverts on indian brook or the water line you know a lot of other super pressing issues and we can start tackling these and anything we can do um you know it's um we're allowing the the applicant to subdivide the land and all of that you know and and there's a cost to that sometimes and we and i agree we want to you know we don't want to put people out more than we have to and maybe things can be done to again not put the sidewalk so far away from the road and i know there's an easement discussion but the right of way of that road has got to have plenty of room is it's just my guess i mean it's a two-lane road with a micro shoulder on both sides the, the, the right of way has got to be 49 and a half feet, which is 25 feet either side of the center line. Lanes are generally 12 feet. So you've got 12 feet on the other side of that white line on the north side there that we can find a good sidewalk in. And so maybe the way to reduce the cost is to, you know, maybe not have a Cadillac sidewalk, but just have something that's safe and, and will help people. And like I said, the, the, the bus... Um, I don't know if it goes there at all now, but it always sometimes went, but not always. So people would take the bus, they get off at that intersection and walk to Global Foundries. I had friends that did that, and it's um, it's scary. And not everybody has cars. Uh, like I said, I rode my bike for 28 years down that road, um, and so I'm speaking from experience. Okay. And and hopefully some of that background on why we did it on the north side it was as as. Um, the development director said because there's that big triangle you come to and it would be unsafe to have a crossing there because people tend to drive speed limit is 35 people are doing 40 and more on that street and so you want to limit the number of street crossings that's why riverside and the village put the sidewalk down there and we know it's a long-term project but anything we can do is great did you have any other questions for me on background or anything no i think that's been helpful thank you all right Thank you. Um, Thank you. Anyone else in the audience on this topic? Anybody on screen uh, for this topic? Wait, how many people do we have left? Up? Just Rob? It's Rob. <laughs> ah. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it should be stated we're, we're obviously not against pedestrian connectivity. Yeah. I don't want that to be the conversation here. I, I just think actually building it is, you know, it's been that way for a very long time. Does this one house make unsafe condition where that sidewalk has to No, be? but you're 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 gonna have to help it fix it to to do your thing. That's how yeah, that we're works. Helping with an easement. Um I I guess I'm 
you know, I, I'm sensitive to a couple of things. One is um, it's, it's clearly supposed to be there. Two is we want to make sure that it's integrated properly into the ultimate uh, final city plan. Um, you know, I guess if we're going to tell the applicant that it needs to be there, somebody better be sure that's where they want it. And they better figure out where this piece is going to fit in because, uh, you know, we're, we're poor in concrete, as they say, right? Um, and you want it to be in the right place. So um, I guess my feeling is that if, if you want to accept the easement and, and you want to work on the fee, it may not be the fee that you're showing there. There may be other factors related to what that fee really is. But um, I don't think there's any question from the board that we want the sidewalk and we we want it to line up where the city says it should be and if if that information suggests that that's where it goes then we want it there and i don't know that i want to leverage any more than that but you know it should be fair to the applicant because it is a fairly small development uh, but they definitely need to play their part in making this happen can you work with that kind of a authorization yes, yes. <laughs> All right. um how do we make a motion out of that <laughs> we we i do you have any other questions on the subdivision by the way anybody uh, i'm sorry I, i'm not clear <laughs> what I, uh... I haven't made it yet so okay yeah it's, <laughs> we're just trying to get the the wind sent here yeah uh anyone else do, do you have any more other questions on the subdivision I think we only had the sidewalk really as the issue. So I'm going to make a motion that that we um, approve the subdivision with the uh, stipulations uh, and conditions um, in the staff report and that we um, approve it with um, option 3A, which is they get the easement. And then if you want them to build anything, you've got to provide direction to them on exactly where it's going to go. Because, it, it, see, if you let them build the sidewalk, then they are telling the city how the plan's going to go. I don't think that should happen. You, you have a master plan with capital waiting to be spent at some time in the future. You should be in charge of where that sidewalk goes. And I'm assuming it goes on the north side, but what I'm saying is if, if they're engineering for a sidewalk, and if, I would think that needs a curb so it's not, you know, so the cars are, pedestrians are protected from the vehicles, right? That somebody's going to, is that all in the handbook? If we we're going to, you put a sidewalk in, it has a curb, it has a sidewalk, it goes this place. Be specific requirements for a sidewalk and, and the, te the technical specifications are in the land development code. Yeah. Um, not all sidewalks require a curb if there is a space between, if, if there is a green buffer. And actually that often makes it cheaper if you don't build a curb. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 I didn't really understand what, what your proposed motion uh, is. Well, here, you know, they're going to give us the easement, right? Cause right. they, that, that's a thing. Right? right. And so the question is, do they build a sidewalk or do they give you money? That's the next question. So if I can get, if the city, if, if the uh, city engineer uh, signs off on North side being the side to go with, would you be happy with uh, with the applicant building the sidewalk there? I would. Okay. And and you know so if the sidewalk isn't worth whatever you've calculated and you can build it for less, then that's fine. But I I want I don't want the applicant wondering what they're building because the city hasn't figured out what they want yet. I want the city to be involved in telling the applicant this is the sidewalk that we're going to connect to your first piece in the future and it's all going to come together. Yeah, and, and you know, an argu argu our argument is shouldn't that be in place before we submit and not kind of make it up as we go, you know? I mean, it's kind of 
I'm I'm happy to let you guys work it out. <laughs> I, I, I'm not trying to tell you where to put your sidewalk either. I'm trying to tell my city staff to get their act together and have a sidewalk plan in place so that when I tell you, you have to put it in, you know what you're doing. Understood. Yeah. Steve? I think the city engineer drew it all out way back, so it should be a matter maybe they just need to double check it, but it should all be there. I mean, because they can't cost it if they don't you know yeah out have plan. some so idea i think the plan's all there like i think we're i hear people wondering if we have like specifics yeah i believe it's very specific. there's enough there to, to it excellent but your point is taken so uh i'm gonna i'm gonna continue my motion with option 3a that says the city is going to sure. provide some direction to the applicant on what's supposed to be there as part of the approval, but the sidewalk's supposed to be there. I feel like he's picking option three, which is the most lenient. And then I don't yeah. feel like the added on statement is really encompassing what I want it to encompass. I feel like it should be option three with the understanding that working with the engineer either fees to pay for the sidewalk or they will create the sidewalk themselves will happen that i thought that's what i was saying because mm. it's 3a right it's not I... just three mm. you get the but there's a stipulation that they have yeah. to work with the city to you get the easement done deal and then you have to either build it or you have to give them you have to provide funding for the city to build okay it. one of those things has to happen to get a Right, we are. We're taking three already. You, you, I have you been can, a little nebulous, in my opinion, but I'm on board now. Okay. Right. I think you can, you can ignore the options altogether <laughs> and articulate, what, you know, what what the requirement. I think that that's the most important clarity we need here. Whether or not, yes. like, ultimately the uh, the the applicant is required to, uh, you know, to build, uh, the sidewalk or fund the sidewalk upon uh confirmation by the city engineer that that side is where. Where, um, where um, speak. hearing the long decades of history of the need for the sidewalk, I would like to see it built myself. And if the city somehow can't manage to provide that direction, uh, for whatever reason, um, then, then I would accept money toward building it. But I don't think the city should be, uh, you know, dragging its heels. You have a great opportunity here to make it happen. So how do we? <laughs> All right. So we have that emotion. Yeah, I think that we have yeah. a question. Oh. Yeah. So I, I just have some clarification <laughs> questions. So when we're talking about building a sidewalk, um, I don't think it's reasonable for me to build a connection on, um, you know, my neighboring property to connect to park street it's not no we're not saying that okay so yeah. so I'm just both... just in front of your property yeah. okay um yeah, which is dumb but that that's how that goes yeah and then was yeah. the the easement of building the the sidewalk was the instructions from the city engineer should we put a time limit on that like um like they will provide the instructions by i don't know time. if i can I or... don't know if I can do that because what I'm really trying to do is get my city to take care of this. And and I there's no guarantee that they will, even though they now have a piece of the pie, right? Yeah. Piece of the puzzle in place. Well, I, I, I am confident we, we would be able to yeah. respond in a timely fashion. Well, how but but what about the piece between Park Street and Oh well that like, might not be connected. I I think yeah. your your so, point before was that there might just be a gap. Yeah. In terms of providing direction on where this current P, uh, this the required sidewalk uh, has to go, uh, I I'm confident that the the uh, city staff can uh, provide that direction um, uh, in a timely fashion. Okay. So, who wants to read the motion back? <laughs> Is that? Can we do that? We have the stipulations and conditions that are already on here. And um, the last one needs to be modified um, 
to provide an easement and a portion of the sidewalk in front of the uh, on on the applicant's property um or uh, hmm? sorry continue I, well, I, we have to modify the fourth proposed condition because it relates to the sidewalk. So we're approving it with the stipulations and conditions of the modified um, applicant shall provide an easement to the city for future yeah. construction of a side. Well, an easement to the city and construct a sidewalk along River Street. And and if it gets bartered down to a a payment because you couldn't tell them how to build the sidewalk then that's <laughs> that's up that's your problem i have faith that the city will deal with it in a timely fashion it will happen there's a lot of culverts to fix out there i still have faith. all right so then can we lobby the we need to go to the capital projects meeting, don't we? Um, all right. So Everybody, we're approving we the now? final subdivision plan with the stipulation that they put a sidewalk in front of the year property. Well, it's yes. that they provide the easement for the sidewalk yeah. only and then the two-tiered no. option. No, they're they we're really saying they need to put, they provide the easement and build the sidewalk on their portion of the on their property. on their in front of their portion yeah. of their in front of their property. It's a long time. I mean, have we been in motion? Because we still need a yeah. Time. That's a motion. Do I need a second? I think it's easier to build it. In some yeah. So we've approved the the plan the right with way. stipulation you know, stipulation that they build a sidewalk in front of their property it's like very simple yes. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah any further discussion all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. motion carries unanimously thank you thank you gotta get better about motion i have it was so easy at the end. All right. That's fine. But we were going to get to see Doug Henson somehow out of all of them. Um, all right. Application number three. Conceptual site plan for a proposed mixed-use development to construct a five-story building with two commercial spaces on the first floor and 52 apartments on the upper stories at 17 Park Street in the uh, CB District. BC. City BC. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, by my Mylot Real Estate agent for Handy Hotels and Rentals LLC owners. We have applicants here. Introduce yourselves, please, for the record. And I'm uh, Brett Grabowski with Mylot Real Estate. And I'm Greg Dixon with Krebs and Lansing Consulting Engineers. All kinds of people in the audience. Did everybody get sworn in that's planning to say anything? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, good. A uh, little bit of a presentation, then I'll listen to staff and the board. Yeah. So we're here. Do we have um, anything that we can put up or no? Yeah. I, uh, whatever you you need that you've already submitted. Maybe yeah. My uh, site plan, the proposed site plan. Okay. C one point zero. This this uh, document right here. You go down one. Two, one more. There we go. This one. Oops. So we're here this evening. So uh, my lot real estate is uh, obviously it's the applicant here on the site, and we actually will be purchasing uh, the property from Handy's Hotels and Rentals uh, in in the future. And so we're here tonight to give you a, a, an overview of of the project and a site that has been sorely needed to be redeveloped for quite a few years. 
there was a previous approval on this site quite a few years ago for a uh, smaller project, um, roughly three, three stories in scale. And obviously since that was approved, oh, somewhere around seven or eight years ago, uh, there's obviously been, been quite a bit of redevelopment. Uh, specifically, Milo Real Estate has been involved with uh, both uh, the 4 Pearl Street project and 11 Park Street, which have been uh, completed. Uh, the 11 Park Street project was completed uh, roughly approximately two years ago. So what we are proposing now on this site um, is a, uh, as described by staff, is a, uh, a, a, we're looking to take advantage of the, the, the new regulations that were passed in the springtime. What we are proposing is a five-story building. Um, and I, I think the, the benefit of what we're doing here and the ability of to propose what we're proposing to you is we're going to be leveraging uh, quite a bit of the infrastructure that was already put in place with the 11 Park Street project. Um, so the, the, the building as proposed is a uh, five stories, 52 units, uh, a mixture of studios, micro units, full one bedrooms and two bedroom units. Uh, with also approximately six six thousand roughly six thousand square feet of commercial on the first floor parking is going to be provided in even though there is not a minimum parking standard now in the new regulations we are actually going to be providing three levels of parking on the project one is going to be underneath the structure uh, and that will be accessed through the ramp for 11 park street so we'll be essentially be combining the foundations mm -hmm. uh, underground uh, there will be um, a parking deck similar to what you see on 11 Park Street, whereas we'll be utilizing the existing ramp for 11. And as, as you come up the ramp, if you're familiar with the, the flow of traffic for 11 Park, as you come up the ramp right now, you hang a left. Well, now we'll be able to hang a right as well. Uh, and so that structured parking, which will be tucked in behind the building, we're providing for approximately 19 parking spaces. And then underneath the structure itself, similar to 11 Park Street, uh, there will be another 27 spaces and that will be accessed off of the, uh, is, it, is, it, is there a name for it, but the, the school street driveway right now that provides access all the way up and around and back out to Park Terrace. Um, so the, the uh, building as proposed will be uh, a flat roof building. I don't know if we want to put up, Chris, we can put up the, I guess, the architectural design. Do you want just yeah that probably that's probably fine for now and that is basically a, a, the preliminary design of the building showing the five stories with the commercial on the first floor uh, the, the building is kind of broken up um, a little bit of relief uh, in the building itself we're showing some decks uh, as well as as you go to the back of the building you'll see that it is it is raised up on that one section and there will be parking underneath that and then that'll tie in with the parking deck that'll be behind it but you cannot see on the uh the far side to the left is there is going to be some uh outdoor space at that upper level as far as community goes and then i think overall generally this evening we're looking to kind of just as i gave you an overall description of the project is to kind of go down through some of staff's comments discuss a little bit farther in regards to the board's general take in regards to the building i mean there were some comments in regard from staff in regards to colors and 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 uh, materials and, and that's all for discussion this this evening those are very easy to actually to modify and change based upon comments from 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 you um, and then we can also go in and discuss a little bit more in regards to staff's comments in regards to the general uh, circulation in regards to pedestrian access, uh, how the buildings uh, are going to relate to each other. And, uh, and then obviously Greg Rabidou is here this evening to my left, who is actually, uh, his firm has actually done the design in all three buildings that we basically own or have, have, have built here at Five Corners. Uh, and then Greg is here to discuss specifically the site work. Can I ask a parking question? Yep. Um, so 11 Park just to, is the Boxcar Bakery building? Yes, correct. Okay. Making sure. Um, and that parking in the back is public parking? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and then, so are you, so this building, anyone who is in this new building, are they going to be, you said they're exiting on School Street? Underneath. 
underneath. But yes. they'll come out on School Street, and then they'll either go to um, Pearl Street. So, so you have so just like so as far as the circulation goes, yeah. just like you have from Eleven Park, right? So you can access Eleven, come out of Eleven Park. All three levels can, as they come up, can go left or right. So they can access out on Park Street, or they can come left and come out and come out through School Street. If that's okay, what but if that's I mean, it's very difficult to make a left onto Park Street. So for the most part, I mean, if you live there, you're probably gonna go up Park Terrace and come down and make a right onto Pearl. I mean, People access the the circulation is all. You see people accessing. Have you ever tried home. to make a left out of? I'm I'm through here every day, multiple times yeah, a day. It's kind of difficult. And and so well, you're also looking as part of this project too is the reduced flow of traffic that the yeah. design the Crescent Connector okay. is going to provide for. But so they'll come out and they'll either go left and then right onto school and back down or left the, there, onto Pearl. There's there's three ways yeah. to exit okay. this project one is going to be park terrace one is going to be hang a left and go up park terrace mm -hmm. and out and then the yeah. other is to come down school street come down school okay and then go to park. that's yeah 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 from out of the school it's not called school street so it's, yeah. it's yeah, school school street <laughs> school, <laughs> school street's up top yeah they're, 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 park they're, street school yeah. okay yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. let's call it the school driveway <laughs> school. i got it now yeah. but you'll go out and make a left onto Park Terrace, make a right on school. If you want to go out that way. Yeah. If you if you or want to head make west. A right onto park and make a left. Yeah. If you wanna if you wanna head west out to Burlington, yeah. Yeah. then the, the shortest route is going to be Park Terrace left, right on the school street, left onto fifteen. Yeah. Which is yeah. which is rough. Which is rough. Which is rough. Yeah. Or you can go but down to um or you can go out to the light. I mean, it's just a, that's go, a lot more volume of people yeah. trying to do that. Well, but they won't. So the, the the point is they'll they'll find an easier route, which which probably has them cutting through Indian Acres or going down to the next light and all the way out to West Street. West Street. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, we, currently, right now, the, your whole five corners is zoned for this kind of density and this type of redevelopment. Yeah. And, and and it basically takes into account that, yes, you may have to, the timing of the five corners. I would assume that once the Crescent Connector is completed next summer and that traffic is taken, that diversion of traffic is taken into account, I would assume that five corners, that light is going to get retimed. And that's going to be all due to the adding a light to school street. Mm. So. Okay. I just yeah. was, yeah. Cause there's a lot going on there, yeah. and and there have been multiple um, options surfacing, including closing Main Street, which has uh, you know for that little section, which turns five corners into a four corner intersection. And um, there's a traffic study which shows that uh, actually improves traffic in all directions at five corner. What was five corners? Uh, so. Uh, but there isn't a whole lot of um, support for that until the Crescent Connector goes in because nobody wants to dream of what really happens there until that road's in place okay. and you can try it. Yeah. So um, it is a game changer to get the Crescent Connector in place and to watch it function. And, uh, and I, the, the, the strong uh, hope is that that really cuts down on the amount of traffic going through five quarters from at least the Park Street side. It, it should cut down dramatically. Um, so uh, I had a number of um, comments, mostly related to pedestrian activity. Uh, and and then I, I just, um, it's nice that we can kind of see the whole thing because the presentation focuses on just the one proposed building and it doesn't really put the whole package together there. So as the project, um, goes forward into the next phase, I think we're going to want to see that, you know, just remind us how it all comes together to have four Pearl and 11 Pearl and this one, right? Yeah, and we can yeah, discuss because that, that was part of staff's yeah. uh, comments, and we've actually already kind of thought about that a little bit, and we're actually really, as what we're doing in regards to the parking, as far as combining all the assets, basically, 
Yeah. We're looking to do that as well as on the front of the of the building as well. Uh, and so it, it, we're actually looking to, if we go back to, since we're kind of on that, we can yeah. jump around if you guys don't mind, mm -hmm. um, since you brought that up. So if we go back to the site plan, there were some discussions about the space in between the buildings. Mm -hmm. And we're really, uh, you know, and I wasn't necessarily really happy with this additional design either because I think the the space between the buildings that you're seeing there, I think is a pretty valuable area yeah. um, to, to develop more as a pedestrian friendly type area that can serve. Cause we do, we've already had a lot of interest in regards to the commercial on the North on that, in that building itself. Um, and so we really see that space in between the two buildings is really being kind of an outside terrace type area that can be utilized by potential we, right now we have two restaurants that are actually interested one is in the uh the 2500 square feet in 11 park and then we also have some interest in the uh the other the the northern space in the new building that we're proposing um and seeing the basically be able to utilize that area in the middle as basically outdoor type seating terrace type area in order to maximize that or utilize that we're actually looking to connect um to have the sidewalks actually connect all the way up through. So that all of that area right now, since the two buildings from an elevation standpoint are gonna be at the same elevation, so 17 Park and 11 Park will basically be at the same height, that to have a sidewalk that runs, since there are, and there's some discussions about the two levels of sidewalk, unfortunately we don't have any choice but to kind of continue that through. Um, and because it's been something that's that happened here it started with Four Pearl because of the elevational change from this corner to that corner is actually multiple feet of drop. And it, it's really deceiving. And so that's how as the sidewalk comes around the building and it's at one level, you start to get an elevated type sidewalk. And so now we're looking to essentially, obviously Park Terrace kind of broke that up. But now as we go to the farther south and we have the 11 Park building that is already built, we're looking to continue that all the way through so that the ele the, the two-tiered sidewalk will remain. It will not be steps down and steps back up. It will come all the way through, and then it'll be a consistent elevation between the buildings that we can further develop, basically kind of a, as an open terrace-type area. There we go. That's a good vision. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I, I like that idea. I just quickly uh you know maybe measured the distance between the two buildings there uh and it's around 20 feet 20 feet uh, mm -hmm. yeah okay um and so that's that's a pretty nice little pedestrian area it looks like there's some plantings and maybe it hasn't quite in yeah, so we, we haven't it was yeah it's not even close to being developed what we yeah. wanted to look like so we chatted uh, about it today and those plantings would kind of go away that yeah. whole 20 feet would almost become flat yeah. um from the back of the building all the way to the front the stairs that you're looking at right now would effectively be removed yeah. and it would just come flat straight across there to the next building. And that whole area could be used for courtyard for um, eateries and stuff like that. And yeah. it would just be a pedestrian and, way. And then to remind the board too, those telephone poles go away eventually. So we've already had discussions with Green Mountain Power. So all the poles go away on, on, on Park Street coming in. So their main goal right now is to move all the poles back to actually the south side of the Church Street driveway. Mm -hmm. And it goes underground and over into the Lincoln Inn property, which which we also, my lot real estate also owns. So at this point, so we're going to be back in front of you as far as that redevelopment goes. But it kind of helps now that that our goal is to all these lines go underground, um, that which we're obviously should, everybody should be excited about. So, um, so, you know, eventually, like I said, you look at those poles right now, as well as a pole to the right, which is right at Park Street. Um, and yeah, all those crossing lines, all that, all that gets, ends up getting buried um, in, the, in the long run. What about like ADA compliance though? I mean, how do you... So, so, yeah, so ADA, obviously right now from the Park Street side, that's ADA. There's a small ramp there, right? Because, because we have, we have parking or handicapped parking basically is underneath the parking deck as well as over on the parks on the four pearl site we would also have uh if you look at the site plan oh we, yeah that's like i forgot where the ramp 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, and then there will be, as you go to the other 11, uh, you know, to 17 park, mm -hmm. um, there will be there. Well, there, there'll be, we will allow right now the ADA parking for a seven, seven park, 17, you know, 17 park street, the new building yeah. is actually going to be, it's underneath the parking deck. There's going to be ADA parking spaces there. And so there'll be access either from the Park Street side down through, or there will be, even though we're talking about this pedestrian type area, there will be ADA access through that. I guess that I, I, I looked at that for a while on the, the drawings and I'm, uh, it feels like somewhere you need to, once, once you enter at 11 on the north side of 11 and you get on that pedestrian elevated section, I want to be able to get back down again somewhere without going all the way back. It's like a giant dead end, you know. So, so we, I guess we were coming to the to, to the board to discuss that a little bit. Yeah. Um, we felt that, I mean, what what we're showing right now is sort of that effect. But you're seeing how much room it soaks up and how basically the two the space in between the twenty feet in between would would just become a ramp. And is that a desire? Uh, which we feel it, it's not. I, I feel that having it flat and having areas for both of those businesses and creating a space that is a little bit elevated from uh, the street is, is warranted. Uh, the other point being is, is what are you accessing at that point? Um, you're not going to any businesses on there. You would have ways to get back around. I thought, uh, and I thought that was all businesses along the well i mean no, we, we, i mean yellow, we, we, yeah i mean we are provide like i said we are provide there's basically three ways that you could access any of the businesses along the front of these two buildings specifically one is you can park underneath the 11 park street deck you can either go down by the ramp by 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 the boxcar bakery there's a ramp there you can come as you can see here you can come all the way down internally from those parking spaces under the deck. So you end up right here because that's all going to be at the same level. Or you can park in these two or you can even add additional spaces to park underneath the new proposed parking structure. So there will be basically three different from three different locations. You can access all of the frontage along um, along these two buildings and then if you wanted to you could obviously you can access because it ramps up to four pearl you can go that way as well so I, I think i think we're offering we're offering multiple means of of egress to all the all the stores on the frontage of these buildings and there's also there's also means of egress from the back side as well so these buildings come all the way through so if you have just like four per, just like 11 park, you can actually access all the businesses from the back of the building as well as from the front of the building that are ADA accessible. And the same thing is gonna exist from this building as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I guess I'm still stuck on the, What's that? let's say I'm in a wheelchair. Yeah. Let's say I'm on the elevated, portion of the front sidewalk yeah right uh i can go in and out of businesses because that's where they are mm -hmm. how do i get back down to the the real sidewalk it's like on the south end that that's well we we could greg just said we can provide a similar we can provide a similar means of egress on the south side as we do up at boxcar bakery we just have to move the front door yeah i, I that was, that's i'm i'm thinking that's sort of necessary, but um, you know, we've been pretty careful with some of our recent projects that don't have a front door that's, you know, they have a front door, they have an accessible door that's by the major parking area or access point. They didn't have a front door uh, necessarily off the public right of way front sidewalk. So I think that's still a big thing. You wanna try and make sure that that's accessible yeah. and not, not sort of, difficult but um, and i think we could do that i think the only option that we're that we wouldn't have is that if you're in the exact middle of that those two buildings 
Yeah. At that point, you can't get down to the, to the ground level. Yeah. But we didn't really feel it was necessary because what is what is there to do besides? I don't. I just, next an interesting door? question because I'm not sure. You know, as a building designer, that's not normally where you think about your accessibility issues. Is where does a sidewalk, you know, have to go? But um, but, but I, I think what, but what we just what we just threw out to you as far as yeah. if we can provide accessibility on the south end of that building. I now we're basically providing we're probably can go up because, we're, we're providing multiple ways of access yeah. to, to front and back yep. of, of all the buildings um no i think it's a overall it's a it's a very clever integration of the existing property and the new property and and you should be commended for figuring out how to do that and uh you know probably uh greg's office and well both greg's are managed to really sew that together well so i think that's pretty interesting um it, it's been interesting because in all honesty the longer that we've been involved with these sites the more that these options have kind of just presented themselves for yeah. you know and and it's become a way of um essentially you know in, in the in the town regulations have changed such that it's really encouraged really what we're proposing um, because yeah. we, we wouldn't have been able to do this like a year ago. Really. Right. I, I just want to comment on that because I was on the planning commission when, um, you know, we, we approved four per, uh, park, you know, the first, is it Pearl or park up there? It's, it's, it's four Pearl. 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 <laughs> okay. So we go around the corner. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we encouraged that building to get a little taller, uh, at the corner. Yep. Uh, which hasn't, um, met with everybody's admiration but i think it really worked out well it's just my opinion i'm only one person uh but you know the the density and the um the the presence at that corner is something that should be celebrated really and and i thought that building was successful in doing that and now we're going to march down the street and it's still creating a fairly high uh line there and then by taking advantage of oh in the meantime the village at the time village trustees said we aren't that sure about how tall all the stuff is so we're gonna cap everything in the village center at four stories so uh i think it's actually very interesting that the state has come along and said well here's a way to get that extra story you know we originally this zone was allowed to have six uh so you know you're now down to four through the um, municipal regulations, but now with the, the state layer and the affordable piece that uh, looks like we're gonna be able to go back to five, which um, I, I'm, I support that, but I also recognize the, the community outcry at the, you know, the height issue is, is still not, it's not gone away yet, so. Um, I'm I'm just going to say that I while the regulations will allow it uh I think we all have to be pretty careful about how the treatment is and and so that's why it's important as we look at the whole streetscape some of the other uh, language in the development code talks about scale in relationship to neighbors and so you know you don't want to for example go from you know like going from 4 to 5 to 4 is fine but going from 5 to 2 is is tricky right so uh i'm gonna say that we we all want to be careful about how we handle some of those transitions um and a sensitivity of of what's happening and why uh, the view corridor up to the park street school is practically sacrosanct it it was very difficult for us to to think about how to approve things that start to impinge on that view quarter because it's been such a staple of uh historic uh sort of the community core for so long um and so that's that's also a thing as this building gets closer to the park street school um i happen to walk all the way through all those properties and then along uh you know uh park terrace and whatever is there a name for the road in the back now there's a, no name uh, but I, I just did that last week um, to uh, uh, 
park there and walk to something on on Pearl Street and and it's still a pretty impressive uh, view that School Street uh, Park Street building is is still important and and it wants to be uh, continued to be at least historically viewed up that street as a, a you know a reminder of our our history um, so uh, and I, I don't exactly know where, but your the corner of your building is it about where the corner of the current building is? The, is cor it? the corner of the new building will be closer to the street, obviously. Yeah. But the face of the building is pretty consistent with the existing face of this building right yeah. here. So, uh, I guess what I'm saying is the renderings, the design, um, all of that wants to be evaluated as if you're still on Park Street with an opportunity to look up this which is now going to look like a street instead of uh looking like it's kind of an open space in front of a built uh, a school an old school right you're gonna you're gonna be creating uh and and enhancing a view border and there might be some opportunities in there to do something i i and you know i think you just want to look at that you know maybe there's a building form or maybe there's a something that happens along that edge so that it I think it's building enhances that well the, the, the building itself if you look at the design it actually the, the the wing that goes off the back actually steps back yeah so if you look um, at and yeah so uh again in uh um without seeing the context to, to remember which side of the building is on which corner you know you're you're look if you were standing right here you're looking up towards the school yeah along this face along that along that face so but the thing closest to the park street side which will define the view is the tallest it yeah is the face that goes that way yeah. in this picture just saying you're gonna want to stand there i mean this is why it's so much fun to model these things now it's because you can really see it um you know the technology is there for us to see i think this is going to fall into that category um, in the LDC that says the commission, the, the board is entitled to ask for additional renderings to help them conceptualize, right? So uh, it looks like you're actually most of the way there. You just, but um, I think those kinds of uh, views will be very helpful in having people understand the full context. Of I would suggest we keep looking ahead for that. I think it's the the back side of this as as it steps back and uh, the upper level steps back a little bit. The opportunity for those uh, the views from those apartments is going to be outstanding. You're going to be looking uh, basically sitting on your uh, patio on the fifth floor, looking at Camel Thumb. That's it. And I know you guys have probably been in, in you know, 4 Pearl and, and 11 Park and, and seen the views. I've only been in uh, the corner building, so I, I haven't actually been in the other one. But the views are outstanding. They're, they're some of the most amazing views are in the whole area. So um, Actually, go sit on the roof of 4 Pearl. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, that should, I mean... That could be a marketing tool. I don't know. Maybe that's helpful too. To, uh, here's what it looks like if you're on the building looking out. Uh, but um, I don't. I don't really have other. Uh, a lot of other things to say about the building at the, at the moment. Um, again, I think just having to play nicely with its neighbors and sitting in the environment in the neighborhood is. You know that all that neighborhood language is buried in the village center. Um, you know re redevelopment uh portion so the good news is the building that you're tearing down nobody cares yeah. right <laughs> um it's a it's a good thing and uh, i think the things that you're talking about uh, with it sort of joining its brother on the to the north is going to be really fascinating uh maybe you i don't need to hear it now but uh the street life that's starting to develop on those elevated terraces is pretty interesting. I, I think it took a while to get going, but I think it's starting to show up now. In fact, 
some of this nice weather that we've had in the fall you can walk down there and you see people enjoying uh those spots and and um you know so they shouldn't be underestimated uh, contributors to street life and and the city center no I, I agree i mean i've been like i said we when we when we built we were here and we built developed and built for pearl we were the and i've always said this process here is going to take a while it just does mm -hmm. and and we were the first to the show right so so it's you know i i think the building uh was a, a great contribution a great first step but these like i said it, it takes time i mean you know the re redevelopment of winooski whether you like how it turned out or not is beside the point but it took a while to for that all to happen and a lot of it was the commercial right so if you remember winooski the commercial was vacant for a long time and it, 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 meet, it met a critical mass of residential right and once the yeah. residential finally got there then the business has followed you're seeing the same thing happen here i mean we continue to have you know greater and greater interest of the commercial because the residents are here now um and and it becomes self-sustaining and and they're not as worried about where do I park a thousand cars five feet from the door? Because they know they basically are going to have a thousand people they can walk across the street, and so that's that that becomes you know that that's becomes a really important aspect I think of any of these redevelopment projects in these core centers or these growth centers as they're being designated. And it just it takes time. I think um, you're fortunate in that you have personally the history of what is going on there. You did the first one, you did the second one, right? So those lessons learned and those uh, stories and those observations of how life is changing in the usage and the demand uh, is really helpful for all of us to, to know. Yeah. So I would incorporate that into the presentations because I think it helps everybody in the community figure out, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And they need that. You know, yeah. they need to understand. Yeah, and I think a lot of it too is just as we're here tonight to talk about, you know, you don't think about the, and and we're, and I've always been, and I've been looking at this since we had these first designs, is that you look at the 20 feet that's between the two buildings. When you're redeveloping areas like this at the high density that you guys are promoting, 20 feet's a lot of space, right? Okay, and it needs to be maximized as much as possible because, you know as 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 we've all seen you know when uh, mcgillicuddy's is busy everybody questions why the heck would anybody want to sit outside on top of basically four you know five corners but people do they they're it's it's full people just enjoy that whether they they enjoy they in and believe it or not they enjoy the traffic they enjoy watching the cars by they enjoy the people that go along with it whatever it might be people crossing the street and that's similar and that's as you're referring to as as this gets busier, you know, the, the, the smaller areas need to be developed as best as possible to invite basically people to occupy them um, because they don't need a lot of space. They just, but they still want the area regardless. And so I think there's lots of opportunities to develop these little nooks and crannies around these buildings, but you just need to recognize that that's, that's what people are looking for and then how to actually maximize the limited outside space that 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 comes along with these higher density areas that are that everybody wants and um one thing that struck me walking behind the uh current 11 uh park is is there is a lot of parking back there you just you know and, and i think people would be surprised to know it's there because you don't really see it and it's there and it's it's helpful for the whole area so um, the problems that you know might have been underparked at at Four Pearl are helped by the development of those parking spaces yeah. that are beautifully tucked in behind everything. Yeah, and that's just to I know I asked this already. That's public parking. Yes. Can we actually put signs up that say that <laughs> that's public parking? Well, it is. Yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, in all honesty, you have the biggest public parking lot here. Well, but there's also it, this kind of comes to another topic that I was going to bring up with staff eventually here. Right now, you have a lot of parking over at the school street driveway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For whatever reason, it's a town, you can see it, it is yeah. completely underutilized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
but nobody knows it's there yeah and so and so yes there can be certainly signage but another thing that i think needs to happen is it needs to be unposted because unposted. it's posted between noon midnight to 6 a.m that lot it, it says you're not allowed to park there overnight okay. oh well we don't really want anyone to park there well, I mean, if you're going to, you do if you live there and you need someone to someone comes to visit you, oh, okay. you know, move a car like over there or something. Public. Yeah, but not real, real, they're, they're, that right that, that that lot specifically, yeah. um, really should be open. You know, it just it promotes a lot of people being able to come in because it's a lot of visual, right? And so the yeah. one of the biggest problems with this parking lot here, even though you have sixty public parking parking spaces, nobody knows it's here. I mean, yes, you have some signage. But the number of people that when we built four per were like, hey, you know, there's 60 spaces right across the street. Nobody knew it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's difficult. Whereas I think when this project is built here, it's gonna be this is gonna become a little bit more in the visual corridor. I mean, we talked about having that whole area opened up and making sure you can see School Street. Well, part of the park, the parking is part of it, right? So if we have you know multiple restaurants and stuff, say in this new building as well as in the 11 Park building, then People are going to want to see that and have it be evident that they can park there, and they're not going to have to wor want to have to worry that hey, I'm down here and I'm, I'm at I'm at I'm over it on tap or I'm at McGillicuddy's and we're open it's open later or the restaurant and suddenly it's midnight but hey, I'm parked in this <laughs> in the town lot that says I got to be out of there by midnight. I mean, it's just I don't think it it in this specific case. I I, I think it should be a, a discussion that should be had with with the, the city in regards to potentially lacking or laxing that specific, you know, re requirement or that posting in that area. And I think it's just been really just a, a kind of a standard policy throughout the entire city. And, and maybe it needs to become more of a, on a, it needs to be more direct on a lot by lot basis in regards to, you know, what is, what restrictions are imposed. It's a fascinating comment. Because the part, the whole parking issue is a municipal and individual owner yeah. issue. It's not one or the other. Yeah, and, and and as you said, the 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 eleven park project um, and the deck that we built there has been a complete success. Um, it's really just there was a lot of pressure on Four Pearl um, for the density that we built, which was great, um, but. You know, there was a lot of, uh, I don't want to say resistance, but just a lot of unsurety in regards to, like I said, you have all this parking here, but, and I, I've said this for so many years, if you go downtown Burlington, your perception is, you know, you're going to have to park and walk. That's just going to Burlington. When you come here, that's not your perception. Your perception is I'm going to park five feet from the door. And if I can't, then I'm, I'm out of here. And, yeah, and, and not not really what you want in your village, and that's not what you want in your dense, redevelopment or, of your yeah. dense area. And so, uh, but we are finding that that with the additional parking and familiarity with the additional parking that we've added for Eleven Park, and a similar concept that we're going to be doing here for the for the new, new proposal um, with the three three levels of parking, that I think we're really helping to promote that, and people are just becoming more familiar and more aware of of what they can do here. All right, I just have two other comments and then I'll turn it over to the public if they want to make comments. Um, one was the unit count versus parking, which is always a big question. And I know it's not really specified in the um, city. Is, well, do we still call it the city, village center or is it now a it's city the village center? Village center zoning district. Um, so uh, I didn't have a problem with it. I know that you've got a lot of efficiencies and, and um, one bedrooms and you know people tend to imagine that you're gonna have fewer cars and so on and so forth so I would think the right number of cars on a project like this is probably somewhere between one per unit and one and a third per unit you know like 1.3 you know you could argue that you want a few more but you know this if you're not gonna if you're gonna live somewhere where you don't need a car and it's not here I don't know where it is you know like that's just how that works so I don't, didn't really have a, a big problem with the with the number of parking spaces, even though other, others may say, well, it's a little light. I'm not sure that it is. Um, but but in case somebody wants to park or has a visitor or something like that, I think we still need to recognize that there'll be some demand for those kind of spaces. And if the, the you know, the 
uh, excess or expansion capacity is on the Park Street School, you know, at night, you know, ideal, right? Um, the other was the the nature of the affordable units, and I wasn't quite sure if they were, uh, you know, is it like it's not all going to be, you know, the high efficiency. It's probably some blend of, uh, you know, the other unit types. And, and just I don't know if that was clear in here where it, where that happens. But I'm sure as you go forward, somehow we'll figure out what what the right number of each type of unit is and why. Yeah. I don't know. The... No, we're not going to active 50. No, so exempt. I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're 20. We're going to it's going to be 20 percent affordable and we'll come back with a we'll work with staff in an appropriate mix across the across the different unit types. I mean, that's always been a you know discussion and, and that's fine. We're, we're not really we're, we're not going to sit there and say, oh, yeah, no, we're, all the affordable units are going to be the smallest units we have in the building. No, it's you know, there, there will be, like I said, right now, I don't know if the exact mix, but I think there's six or seven twos there's a bunch of actually yeah. true one bedrooms yeah. and some micro units and and so there's it you know our our proposal in regards to that 20 percent will be uh, will be represented across all unit types and do you have that in, you are you doing that in your other two buildings right now we do not have any required affordability um but the 11 uh, park street pretty much meets all the affordability requirements because we're where you know our our studio units in that building are anywhere between fourteen, actually some were even thirteen hundred, thirteen hundred up to seventeen hundred. So almost every unit in that building actually meets the twenty percent or the eighty percent affordability uh, criteria. Um, anything else on the board for now? Or yeah, um, the short term parking spaces. I think this is a newer requirement. So I was curious, do the other buildings have short-term parking like, or bike parking spaces? Sorry. Yeah, so yeah we're, we'll come back with a, at the final, we will meet, we'll meet the bicycle requirements. I was just, yeah. I figured you Oh yeah, we, we, but we, I was we, we've had some discussions ones. with Chris. So so yes, there are, there are on the front of Four Pearl, there are bicycle parking on the front of Four Pearl. Um, I think we've had some just recently some discussions that um, that we need to add them to 11 Park to go back to that. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some locations within 11 Park that I know we can we can put some we can put some bicycle parking underneath the you know in in behind the building underneath the parking structure. And then uh, obviously since 17 is still under design, we can. We can accommodate a lot of different locations for that, and and you know we you, you talked about you know not having that many parking spaces, but with the sixty some odd bicycle parking spaces that you want me to require, uh, it ought to eliminate some cars. I don't know where problem. that came from, by the way. <clears throat> that, that's a there's a big number in there, and it's it's seen some pushback, and I don't know that we have the ability to push it back, but I we've had a lot of discussion. All, all, all I know is there, there's there's spaces for eight parking space, eight bikes out in front of four Pearl, and I can't remember any time I've seen more than one. Yeah. <laughs> the bike rack. But I, th that's I think okay. the bigger piece is the is the sort of indoor bike storage or the protected bike storage yeah. that's theoretically for all the unit owners. Who, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I don't know. Uh, people can probably chime in, but but a lot of people are familiar with carrying their bikes upstairs and. You know, putting them in. But also, there's a lot of people spaces. nowadays. I don't know if you've been to a bike shop, but most people, the, the amount that they pay for bikes, yeah, they don't care how secure it is. They're not going to leave their bike. Right. They're not going to leave their bike locked with everybody else's bikes. Yeah. They just absolutely. It turns into my son's down in New York City, and his bike is wall art in his apartment. Yeah. So. Yeah, I first of all can't imagine paying that much for a bike, but I'm old school. I guess. Yes. Uh, so. Yeah, the days of buying a Huffy, it just, it's not, you know, they're, they're long gone. I'm going to let Stephen talk for a minute. I might have been very patient back there. Um, sure. uh, you, you can come up to uh, one of the chairs, maybe. Thank you. I think uh, this is a great project, and uh, it's nice to see the, you know, the redevelopment happening. And uh, thank you, Chris. Okay. And um, I just had two concerns. One is short term. Um, 
Uh, I know when they did the building next door, the sidewalk was closed for like a year. And I realized the sidewalk needs to get closed at times, but this is the middle of the city and it would be nice to just close the sidewalk when it has to get closed. Um, you know, you see a lot of other, you know, construction in cities where they'll, you know, make a safe area. And then, you know, certainly there's times, you know, a couple weeks here or there, you know, throughout the construction where it's not safe. Um, but anyway, I'd love to be able to see that there's some way to make it so we don't have to cross Park Street twice as a pedestrian yeah. uh, going through there. Uh, but that's a short-term thing only during construction. Um, the other thing to mention was, you know, I, I think the applicant has, you know, talked very nicely about the synergies and all that, which I think is great. But from a, someone not patronizing the business, say you're just passing through, um, it doesn't feel inclusive. Like when, you know, we envisioned all this stuff years ago and through the different projects in the village and the city, you know, it's like wide sidewalks in the downtown, like where Martones is, like on both sides of the street there, it's a fairly wide sidewalk. And I know when Four Pearl went in, there's like raised up a little bit. And I know my son's almost like tripped on the stairs, like going around the corner. And, but it's really not that high. So it's like, and they got, it's reasonably inviting. But then when they built the one next door, now it's like a three foot wall. And so you're kind of, if you're walking down the sidewalk, you've got like, like a class one row with 18 wheelers and everything. And then, you know, like a three foot wall. And so it just feels like if you've got two way traffic, it feels like you're kind of up against the road and you kind of like to, you know, be inward a little bit. But I understand the conflict with the people patronizing the businesses and we want all that. Um, but my concern is now this one's, you know, it drops another foot or two. And so how high is this wall going to be along the sidewalk? And I don't have a solution, um, but it would be nice if we could somehow do something so that the people walking on the street don't feel excluded. Um, and anyway, um, and I understand, you know, they're trying to line it up exactly. And it does look neat when you look and everything's at the same elevation from the, you know, the building windows and everything. And, you know, so I don't know if they can somehow drop it a little, but I mean, other cities deal with this and it doesn't just all of a sudden as the road's going downhill, you just don't get these like walls. Um, I mean, San Francisco's the extreme case, but, um, there, it seems like there must be something that we can do because it's not hilly. It's just, no, as a, we noted, it's angled. And a couple of, uh, I, I just explain what I, what I think I know about this. And there's a couple of competing things. One is, uh, the sidewalk is already pretty wide where it's flat and the elevated piece is actually over parking. So if we really want to allow uh, that parking to happen, that kind of sneaks its way in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a sense that it, since you, even if it's elevated, that that it's still a pedestrian zone. It's not, you know, it's not a car. So uh, I I hear what you're saying. It's an interesting perspective. I'm not sure that we've uh, fully um, heard. You know, I haven't heard that before, so I'm thinking about it quite that way. But but it it is a is somewhat of a segregation issue. Yeah, that's... And, and and so I appreciate the comment because it's something to think about in there. Um, while on the one hand you can look at, hey, this has some great opportunities if a group of people feel like they're shut out of what we thought was being offered as a, an amenity, then then we're missing something, you know, and maybe there's a way that yeah that and can it, be more integrated. Exactly, and it's not the end of the world. It's just like how I like I was surprised when that got built. You know the raised area at yeah. you know next door that it was that high um and, and then a little disappointed um hmm. but i i understand that i understand the challenges and i don't you know and i know you're trying to connect up and i don't is there any way to like lower the building a little and have like a slant or i i have no idea um i'm just bringing up the perspective and maybe there's nothing you can do and it's just a comment um, well, there, I, I, but as we go down the hill on Park Street, we can't just keep making the wall bigger. <laughs> We're forgetting yeah. about that part of the sidewalk that's close to the 18 wheelers when you're walking. I, I see. I mean, maybe like there's planters on 
the yeah. lower part of the sidewalk yeah. to protect so the people walking on that have like a planter and then the 18 meter. yeah you just want to feel like yeah. there's something there yeah yeah you know and 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 so it doesn't have to be expensive or and all of that i'm just it was just something when i read the plans it's like oh they're gonna do more of that you know and i and i think from the business standpoint it makes a lot of sense and especially it sounds exciting that in between the two buildings of you know possibly two restaurants that sounds like a great idea and you know utilizing those spaces so i it's just you got a lot of competing interests yeah and and that's where the challenge comes in and and i commend all of you and the developer for working with the city trying to come up with the best plan for everybody um and again i i'm you know in favor of the project and all of that so i don't want you to think i'm not it's just something i noticed well, I think it's a, a worthy challenge for for the design uh, designers, including the city, to participate in a way to see if there's something that can be done to more more fully take advantage of that area and mm -hmm. make it feel less owned and more public. Uh, you know, maybe I don't know if the elevation changes, but but there could be. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of places that have done similar uh design and, and thought about you know how wide is an ideal sidewalk and what happens on it and it, it, there's a tremendous amount of research and, and especially you know in the last 15 years where people have really started to try and reintegrate the pedestrian into the street life you know in places where we'd forgotten you know like what's this little five foot piece of something next to a highway you know that's not helping the pedestrian that's freaking them out you know so um there are a lot of techniques out there. I don't know that we've explored half of them. Uh, this is one actually the you know that that is being implemented now. So maybe there's a uh, maybe there's something that we can all think about or do some more research and figure out. You know, like I know at one time there were any number of things like like water features and and other things that happen you can do with a with an elevation change that actually enhance. Mm -hmm. uh the ability to experience yeah to, what's to happening draw there. together yeah so um great question uh don't have any answers yet. yeah well i don't have any answers either <laughs> so anyway i appreciate your time thank you thank you so much um rob you got anything uh you want to contribute uh to this this um conceptual plan at this time no, it looks pretty straightforward, and all the questions that have come up have covered all my questions. All right. Um, anybody else have? Do you guys have more? any specific? I mean, any specific comments in regards to the actual architectural, the design of the building? Um, I I don't. Um, I I appreciate the challenge of trying to provide exciting and and opportunistic uh options for the residents you know this is as much about what they're experiencing from their side of it than it is from what we're seeing from the outside uh buildings even connected together and on the same block are entitled to be different uh i'm not looking for this to be a mirror image of the other one i mean i don't think that's fair uh but again i encourage um the the renderings to include the other buildings so that we can understand how they interact and and what the I mean it's a fairly uh, large sort of um, you know canopy roof breeze sole whatever we want to call the the cornice at the top you know it used to be everybody had one now nobody has one uh, you guys have have one you know help us out you know where how does that all work is is it like along the the south side it's brilliant because you're gonna want that you know but on the um east side the the um park street side and and especially on that corner where it's very prominent because it's wrapping uh i think you know just it, it help us understand how it works what it's doing there what what it feels like up against the rest of the street facades going down uh, Park Street, so that we, um, you know, get a full picture. Anybody else? You know, other than that, the 
know, there's a nice variety of materials. I don't really have a comment on colors at this point. It's, yeah. you know, way too early for that. And, you know, those are pretty easy to change. I think the materials, you know, as you get closer to the pedestrian zone, you're trying to use something more durable or more, you know, resistant to, you know, everything that's going on there. I think you've pretty much shown that I'm, I'm not, I think they were uh, described as fiber cement panels. And then above that, you have sort of fiber cement lap siding, which is all pretty common these days. Uh, the scale of the fiber cement panels on the first level are fairly small, uh, you know, in terms of just how big are they. So, you know, when I looked at the first time, I thought, well, is that block or is that speed? Well, you know, what is, is that some kind of a more masonry type thing for the scale? But, uh, you know, it's described in the thing as, as fiber cement. So uh it it'll be uh helpful and it's all called out too so if i wanted to go look it all up i could kind of figure it out but you know it'll be nice when you come in again maybe you've got samples or you've got a brochure or something we can can see what that really is um i haven't been a big fan personally of the you know let's just um you know change the facade material and start playing games with the outside of the building to make shapes and you know quadrants and whatever else you know throw a little corrugated stuff on there because that's popular you know so i'm actually more excited to see you actually playing with the building volume and creating some real demarcation points um i find that goes a lot farther than just changing the color and material type um so uh i'm i'm very supportive of that and again just looking forward to seeing sort of that develop and get refined anybody else same <laughs> you know yeah. all right uh Anything else from staff or from the applicant that we didn't answer or cover? Thank you very much. Well, oh, yeah. oh. I was going to say I had I had a a, a, a few slides about uh, you know, the long term bike parking uh, kind of examples that uh, that uh, adjacent municipalities uh, have used. But I mean, it sounds like I mean, only if you want it. Uh, yeah, it's it's going to be tricky because it's in the requirements, right? So they're going to have to do something. And the question is, does it detract from something else they could do? Or is it going to get left empty? Uh, neither of which are ideal. Uh, so I'm just going to encourage us to somehow be able to... Um, if we can provide parking in the basement for residents, it just might steal a couple parking spaces. I guess, well, yeah, I guess isn't that the purpose? So yeah, <laughs> providing fifty some odd bikes, and you're assuming that they're not going to need the two parking parking spaces that we may have to steal to actually provide for fifty. And you know, maybe bikes. they can be tucked in places where, because of vehicle swings or because of columns or because of corners or something, that well, it doesn't affect too much. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know, the the other thing that we have done in the past is we, you know, we. There are some there are some products out there that we've used in some other buildings that allow for uh, basically we'd have to because we're only there's 19 spaces underground so there's not a parking space underground for everybody so but we can break it up to some extent where there is actually ways to provide secure parking bike parking for each individual space right so it actually would hang on the wall above their car in their space itself. So that's not 50, but it's maybe 19 out of it, whatever. And then some, yeah. you know, there's, yeah. it can be mixed up. I mean, with, with the, the thing is with 50 bikes, you don't put 50 bikes in a bike store. I mean, so it's, it's a lot of bike parking. And so it, it chances are, it's not going to be in one centralized location. It's probably going to have to be somehow broken up. Yeah. And that, that's entirely uh, fine in terms of, uh, uh, being in line with the LDC, it does not have to be in one spot. It does not have to be climate controlled. It does not have to be. Uh, you just, it's some place you can walk. Like. Secure and dry. Yeah. All right. That's. I mean, that Jennifer, do you have anything from uh, staff comments? Uh, no, not particularly. 
uh, I was the one who added the comment about the color, but like you said, it's something that's very uh, further down the line, not necessarily yeah. important right now. Uh, just like it's a lot of grays and blacks, and and one of the things like yeah, no, I agree. existing colors around the village center, lots of like reds, yellows, tans, things like that. And I'm not saying that this entire building has to match what's existing, but uh, it's it's just kind of like very dark in comparison. Yeah. So, uh, uh, just a general comment, not a big issue at all. Um, everything else is okay, and uh, like we said with the bikes, uh, yeah, we've we've got a couple of uh, um, just examples there where you can. Uh, we believe that in the the amount of space that you've already allotted, those two uh, uh, mm -hmm. parking spaces that are um, just slightly too small to be uh, uh, car yep. parking spaces, um, there's a lot of possible configurations that will accommodate a lot of bikes. Yep. So it's a it's a really good solution. I just wanted to compliment that. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's the only thing. All right, I'll close the hearing and off we go. Thank you guys. Thank you oh, wait, wait, wait. We have to actually approve it, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. I'll take a motion to approve a the... A motion to approve the conceptual plan based on staff Um, I think that's fine. I, they're not... It, this is more for input and, and just to see that it, you know, passes the, uh -huh. the straight face test and all that so kind just of thing. Just a straight thing, motion so. to approve? The conceptual so. plan yeah um you know we've given them comments and and they have uh, more material to provide for the next round but at least we're we're all gen we're not we're all saying it works it's it's close you know basically i didn't hear anything that wasn't a tweak uh in the big picture um i i guess all of the parking and the circulation and the vehicle oh, the one thing i did have is just a um Sorry, was uh, accommodations for um, you know deliveries and drop-offs and packages and you know uh, Amazon and all that stuff, right? So knowing that it's already happening at the other building, I'm sure you guys have all the answers. Uh, having uh, you know a package truck stop in on Park Street probably not a great, right? They probably wouldn't survive too long doing that unless it's midnight or three in the morning but i i bet they do it all from the back so uh as long as you have an answer for um the deliveries and the dumpsters and the the package stuff i on we will yeah good yeah. you know uh, even if it's up or down i don't whatever you guys do is as long as that's solved we'll, we'll be fine yeah good all right so uh motion to improve Again, did motion I get a to second out of this concept oh, plan? Okay. I second that motion. Appreciate you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any further uh, business on our agenda? Other? Is there any, Chris, one thing that uh, would, uh, and Jennifer, one thing that would be helpful uh, for you guys is to keep us aware of things that are happening around the community or, you know, where's the Crescent Connector or what did Act 250 tell us next or why did someone get an extra story, right? Like those developments that affect us that we don't necessarily track or what my big one one of my big ones is when a project gets approved and then it has to still go through act 250 which in the village center hopefully goes away kind of soon or already did uh but um we've had projects that act 250 made some conditions upon and we didn't know about them because they happened so far after our project and then we'll find out later that well we had to do this because act 250 said so and you know it feels like we want to know that stuff uh, not saying anything's going on, but the one, the one piece that we approved a long time ago is the hotel going up next to the Jolly Good. What is it? Uh, it's good stuff. Um, that was approved conceptually. I was on the the planning commission. It was approved. It we didn't have design control at the time, so it was mostly a site plan. It's going to be a footprint here and a footprint here. I have no idea what that's going to be. 
what it looks like. I mean, I think it's a hotel, but I don't know what it looks like. And that's kind of weird, you know, like now we do have design control, but that was already approved. So let's say you had uh, you know, some knowledge of what that was going to look like. I would love to see. Right. We actually do. We, we do have drawings, um, uh, updated drawings uh, for that. If you'd like to How about see, we'll next meeting, we'll look at them. <laughs> it's an extended stay suites too. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, I, as far as I know, his plan is uh, uh, actually to run it on his own brand right now. Uh, Andy Hotels and Suites. Uh, but um, the, the, the one change that they came up with was just a change in the number of, uh, of rooms based on how they arranged the, the internal doors. Um, yeah. It wasn't actually a, a substantial change though, um, in terms of floor area or uh, the capacity. Yeah, it, it's, it, we, we like to learn from the past. And, you know, what we learned was it's not really, we, we're uncomfortable when we have to approve things and we don't have design control because we don't exactly know what's going to happen. And, you know, we didn't get to know before, but now we do. Um, and the, uh, I still, I'll come, I'll come by the office at some point because I want to go back and see what we actually approved and then kind of look at what got built and see what, you know, was it possible for us to imagine that at the time? And, you know, did it work out the way we thought and so forth? Because I'm not really that comfortable. Yeah, well, I, I do. I have all of those um, on file, uh, including the final, the, the final drawings. Um, if you ever want to see them. Okay. I Good. would like to see those. Can I come by or? Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to. Um, if you want to look at them right after. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, well, those are motion to adjourn. Oh, I was about to say someone's heading out the door. Second, no, Mike. Uh, all right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, Rob. Aye.